Hey y'all, it's Rosie here, and I recently shared my thoughts on Glitter and Lasers Adventures um, plus size travel hacks, which was like Travel 101, and she has done a Travel 102. Now, I didn't particularly find 101 like <clears throat> super triggering, <laughs> maybe I should say. Um, I definitely felt like there were a couple of things um, that I personally wouldn't have done. Like I used that pre-board um, when I had like pretty serious mobility issues. And I also used it like right after my surgery because there's no way I'd have been able to maneuver the way I should have been able to. Um, so if you're just a bit bigger, I don't know if I would recommend doing that. Um, but Definitely, if you know you're going to struggle, I would recommend asking to pre-board. The other things, I don't know. I think, like, with some reflection, I've thought about how she talked about the um, asking the hotel to accommodate you. And for the life of me, I couldn't figure out, for the most part, what would be, like, a huge issue that the hotel would have to do. So I'm a bit stumped there and maybe she'll talk about it here. The only other thing I really didn't like was um, about the guided tours and asking for them to slow down and things like that. Maybe this is gonna sound crazy, like y'all don't come for me. <laughs> like, But I genuinely, I said it in the last video and I, I still really feel it. I, I don't think that that's okay because there's a lot of other people on the tour and in order for like walking tours to get where they're going to go, they kind of have to keep a schedule. Do you know what I mean? So the pace that, typically the pace the guide sets is the pace that needs to be kept throughout the whole tour. So while unfortunate, there are a lot of like guided tours, historical tours, bar crawls, everything, that come with some sort of mode of transportation. So like a horse and buggy, a cart, a little bus, one of those awesome like pedal bars. There's lots of other options other than a walking tour that if you know you're not gonna be able to get around <laughs> that you would choose to do. Um, maybe that sounds a bit callous, whatever whatever fat activists come for me I'm a plus size woman I'm allowed to speak okay anyone's allowed to speak I don't know why I said that okay let's do this travel 102 video hey everybody now if you were here I guess a week and a half ago you might have seen my travel 101 video and in that video I watched I wonder why she can't just put these things. videos on her regular channel all of you to leave me questions and comments seems random story. right and it turns out I, I missed some things. So we're gonna talk about all of those today. But if you haven't watched Travel 101, I would start there because the most basic things are in that video. This I is gonna address- I can't decide if I like her top um, or don't like her top. Concerns. It is but great with her skin color video, though. I just wanna say thank you. Uh, we did not anticipate having so many of you watch this first video. And it made me really excited about what we're doing and how we're gonna help a lot of people just see the world. And before I get into the rest of the tips and tricks for travel, I don't know if there was anything like life changing or like that people left on the great information in that first one, because there like, wasn't. They're just good things to hear. I know that you're not alone in traveling and that there's other people who've done it besides me and had a great experience. So I'm just gonna read a couple of those comments and then we'll jump into the next set of advice. So our first comment what is from Jane H. She said she traveled to visit family and they took her to a restaurant so she could experience food she'd never experienced before. And the amazing thing is, is that the waiter started to seat them, but he saw that she was plus size and just moved them to a different table where she would be more comfortable. That restaurant, she said, won her heart and her business and just reinforces that there are more kind people out there than mean ones. She not like a normal thing. And said, she was horrified the first time she was asked for a seatbelt extender and the steward just went and got it for her. And she realized by asking that first time that she built it up as a huge ask in her head, but it really isn't that big a deal. And then our okay, last comment- I've got to pause it. I have several thoughts on several things. As far as the restaurant moving them to a different table, y'all, 
I am not, I know I keep saying like, I'm not that big, but like now at 227-ish, 226-ish, somewhere around 227-ish, um, I was 277 not very long ago. And if there was like a table that looked really tight, I'd just be like, hey man, you got a bigger one or do you know what I mean? Like we've all been there where the booth is like this big cause someone was in the other one and moved it. So I don't really think that's anything very special. And people make requests all the time to change table. So I don't really think it's a big deal. Now the seatbelt extender thing, when I was coming back from Manhattan, I was mortified at the thought that I would have to get a seatbelt extender. Those seats are so small and my thigh wants to go under the seat. And even now, 50 pounds less, or when what was I the other week? 30, 40 pounds less, okay, when I went to Washington, D.C. My thigh still wants to go under the armrest, right? So when I start to think about people who are bigger than me and they have to get a seatbelt extender or whatever, how uncomfortable are they making the people in the next seats? Like, are they taking over the whole armrest? Like, is that person going to be rubbing against them the whole time? And I know that we have no control over the size of the economy seats. And I swear every time I get on a plane, the seat gets smaller, especially on those like newly renovated ones. I'm telling you the seats get smaller and smaller every time. And I'm not even very tall. And on a lot of the economy seats, my knees touch the seat in front of me in the upright position. So I can only imagine how people who are taller than me can get along. Cause I always try to get like exit row if I can. Although granted these last couple of times I've flown, I haven't been able to do that because I'm not physically capable of being like, yes, I could open the door. Although now I probably am but not the last couple of flights, like back from San Diego or <clears throat> just back from DC. So I just, being bigger than me, like I, God help you because you need to buy two seats. And I know that's gonna sound crazy or either get a business class seat or a first class seat because the seats themselves are wider, you have more room and you're not encroaching on someone else's space. And I know that sounds crazy because it's like, I oh, I paid for my ticket. But the person next to you paid for theirs too. And it's kind of unfair if you're just like ballooned out and they can't even exist in their own space. That's wrong. I think that's wrong. I think if you know you're going to be spilling out of the seat. And honestly, she did say this in the last video. And I do it all the time. I just assumed it was something people do. You can check Seat Guru and it'll give you the whole layout for the plane you're gonna be on. And it'll also give you the measurements for the seat. Like, so you know how big that seat is and you can take a rough guesstimate at your own body of if you're gonna fit in that or not. Okay, so back into it. It's from Livewire717. And she said that another thing she likes to do is arrive early when traveling. So if there is any problems or issues that arise, you can ask during a lull and you're not, you don't have to feel like a bother. So I thought those were three really great comments from you guys, just reinforcing about what we talked about in the last video and what we're going to talk about today. Now today is literally a hundred percent from comments on the previous video, things that I also had to research a little bit, some of the things I didn't know. So we're going to jump right in. The first question I got a couple of times was about TSA. And I'm gonna tell you right now, and I'm gonna, I told you I would always be honest on this channel, that TSA is biased. There was actually research done by the government accounting Wait, what? office no. that concluded that the false alarm for passengers with a normal BMI was less than false alarm rates for overweight passengers. Now, there is no such thing as a normal BMI. That's a whole other conversation. But it does there is a thing in an academic BMI. study that if you are plus size, you're more likely to hit the trigger. I feel like there are two ways that we tend to activate the triggers more. First, just bigger hips hitting the sides of an entrance machine, either the mental metal one she or like touches the one where you the go machine? like this. Now in the one where you go like this, I guess it's radiation. I don't know what they're doing, but they're scanning you, right? The wider you stand, I got that pre-check thing. Flag it. 
And if you still flag it, so I don't have to go through that bad boy. Knees, hips, and arms. I don't know why that is. I don't know why that machine doesn't. And I don't have to take off my right. shoes. But I'm awesome. constantly flagged on the back of my knees and my upper arms, no matter how wide I stand. Some of you will be okay just by standing wider, but for a lot of us, you're just gonna have to accept the fact that you're gonna get. I don't have a comment on that because I, I don't know. There's another option to get TSA pre check or global entry. Yeah, now, pre check is and so worth entry it. Entry ensures you don't have to go, they go hand this in one, hand. And you just need to make it through the Mendel gate without touching yep. your sides. This one's perfectly fine. If you do touch your sides, most places will just let you go through again. So, those are your options. You can either go. Know that you're gonna have to stand wide and potentially still get padded down or invest in something like a pre-check and a global entry where you're not gonna have it's to not, go through that unit. I just have to say this, as someone who travels literally all the time, whether for work or what have you, uh, if you get the global entry, it comes with TSA pre-check. So you'll have both for five years at one flat fee which when I got mine was like $85 versus paying $75 just to get TSA pre-check. So definitely worth it and it's good for five years and I can't tell you how much time, effort, you don't have to pull anything out, like you don't have to take anything off, like shoes, belt, jacket, it's awesome. Those of you who know, you know. And have a better chance of not flagging it, but we know through research that you're more likely to flag it if you're plus size. Okay, a big amount of discussion was when to choose first class versus choosing two seats. I personally typically choose two seats. And the reason is, is some first class seats are still I like really first small. Class, though. And because a lot of times it's cheaper. Internationally, additionally, in some air airlines, first class is just two seats or a seat in between you and the other passenger. So it actually becomes a better price for the same thing, just in a different class. You're not in the front, 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 front section of the plane. So if you're trying to decide between the two, this is how I typically make the decision. I look at the seat widths, which you can look at Seat Guru or the websites for the airline themselves. I also look at the length of the flight and whether the chair reclines or not. If I'm on a really long flight international, sometimes I'm gonna take that first class seat because I can totally recline and go to sleep. But it is- Or business or premium flight. economy it's because it's gonna- to fly It's it gonna lay in most out. cases to buy two seats. Again, sometimes you can find better deals either way. It just, most of the time it's cheaper for two seats and that's why I do it. I also do two seats because several airlines refund you for two seats. We'll talk about which airlines those are in just a little bit. And also sometimes I do two seats because I typically don't love the people in first class. I sat next to a guy in first class who literally had a lesson for me about my weight. And I just feel like sometimes, and this is maybe my own experience. That's why I put my headphones in and don't talk to people. Class, what the heck? More judgmental. Um, not no, I think that's rude. National trips, but I don't agree with what she's so saying. That's been my personal experience, so I'm making those choices based on mine. Your experience might be different. I'm not saying her experience is wrong. Seats, just my experience in first class was not like that. Just put your those seats don't have armrests that go up. Headphones on, and they are not going to be comfortable. They are a waste of buying a second seat. So don't buy bulkhead, which is oh god, those fixed seat, things are awful because. You feel like yeah, a pack sardine. That your body your can't. Flight. Some flights you can, but generally you can't. There's two tips and tricks no, for finding the flights are that fixed. are affordable that I like to use. I love Google Flights. It's just flights.google.com. Super easy. You can put in where you're going. You can even just put where you're from and see Solid. if flights are cheap from around. Agree. It's a great way to as long as you don't care what airline you're on. Thick or thin, it's great. You can also put a Chrome extension on that search, which will also overlay the leg room of each flight. So if you're worried about being tall or having extra leg room, I like to use this little extension on top because it gives you exactly how much leg room you're gonna get. And you'll find out it's not all equal. In fact, the seats are closer to similar size than the leg rooms. Some leg rooms are like <laughs> so small and you don't know, you don't know because it varies by plane. Until you get on the plane and then your knees are touching the thing in front of you. A lot yeah. of concern in the comments about I what if I book a second seat and then they give it away. 
If you book two seats, they legally cannot give your second seat away. So if a flight attendant comes to you and says, is this seat open? You just need to say, I've purchased two seats. And they should move on. If they push you, that's wrong. That is like literally not legally allowed. So you need to escalate to the more senior person on the team. Oftentimes this just comes from people who are inexperienced flight attendants. You have to become a Karen. Of size before. Additionally, if you're worried about how your airline is going to deal with a person of size, which is anyone who might or might not need a second seat, every airline in the U.S. pretty much has a customer of size policy or makes a statement about when or when not. Some make you purchase seat. two seats so because you're, you're too big. And whether you made the right choice, I would suggest looking at the disability. I'm getting anxiety just thinking about escalating things. To see if they have a customer of size Full policy Karen mode with the bob. This is just an easy like gut check you can do. Eventually you begin to learn them by the airlines you fly most frequently, but it's always good to just know what's available in terms of resources and what's the protocol for communicating that either you have an extra seat or that you may need extra space. Now we're gonna talk about airlines outside of the US that also offer customer of size policies. Again, if you're not American, this is super helpful. Also, if you're American traveling international, this is super helpful. So I'm trying to make this as international as possible. Give me the helpful I'm tips. I'm limited to my knowledge and what I could research. I'm sure there are other policies, but I may not be familiar with them. These are the ones I've personally used in the past or are aware of. So the first I'm going to talk about is Air France. And the thing, thing to notice there is if you need an extra seat, they will Ooh, discount I like that Air seat 25% for you. So it's not a full refund, but they will give you 25% off at purchase. And I believe if the flight's Neat. not completely full, you can actually ask for that second seat cost back, um, but it has to be done after the flight is taken. That second seat being refunded is also similar with Alaskan Air. Now I know Alaskan Air is a US airline, but I'm including them because they often don't get discussed and they do fly other places they will also refund the seat, but after you take the flight. And that's also similar to how Southwest does their customer of size policy, purchase ahead of time, and then you can get the second seat refunded afterwards. So now we're gonna talk about two Canada airlines, Air Canada and WestJet. Air Canada will Yo, that would be awkward. for free. I think you just need Southwest, to call them or communicate. Because it's open boarding. If it happens during your flight and you didn't prepare for it, you might be asked to take a different flight. So just call ahead, WestJet, a little bit different you have to have a doctor verify that you need a second seat honestly if i were canadian i would just fly air canada it just seems like an easier solution than having to literally it says westjet will offer passengers an extra seat for certain medical condition a doctor is required i just feel like that is you know it's hard enough for me to get access to my doctor for my airline to demand access is is too much, I'll just take the other Canadian airline. What kind of doctor does she have? I can just call and make an appointment and then the last is, be there. Um, Emirates. And Emirates just launched a new program. It's like a week not out. Not only for plus size flyers, but for literally. Oh my anyone. God. The Emirates extra suites. Extra seats on the plane. Oh, you can I want to fly it so bad. Next to you, it's like 50 bucks, which I think is like a great, um, you know, compromise. Like I'll pay $50 to make sure that this extra seat is next to me but I'm not paying for a full ticket because there's no point. So the only challenge with that is, is that it requires that there's extra seats available to buy. Uh, I have not taken advantage of this. And a lot of them deal, are So I'm not full. sure if you can call ahead and book it and get that $50 deal, or it really does I feel like as a conjunction of so person of size, but things to keep being able to stay in like some type of policy in, in that, for that, which like is the, not common. We call it the apartments, the suites, the residents, all of those that have beds, like true beds. Without problem, but Ugh. maybe do not exactly have a customer of size policy. That would be Lufthansa, Turkish Airways, Aer Lingus, Singapore Airlines, and then <laughs> Air So all five of those I've flown have had great experiences, but they don't technically have a customer of size policy. This is a very big topic, which is just uh, wheelchairs and mobility in general and traveling. I'm gonna cover a tiny bit of it in this video, but I think it really deserves a whole video where I'm actually gonna reach out to some of my friends who are in wheelchairs full time to get a better perspective on it because I have used a scooter at Disneyland and a little bit through the airport when I've had various injuries, but I've never had it be such a... I used their service after I had my surgery in Tijuana. They recommended, you know, on the flight back home, have the wheelchair, 
thing checked by the airline and they'll like get you at the check-in. They take you to your gate. They push you down the ramp to get on the plane. And then there's someone waiting there when you get off the plane to take you to your next gate or take you to baggage claim. And after having the surgery, I would say it was 100% necessary. Like there's no way I would have made it, you know, through the whole airport. But, um, I don't know, y'all. This might be mildly controversial, but at the thought of someone who's just overweight and they're worried about getting winded or something, using them, I don't know if that's right. That's just my opinion. And I say that like, because I don't know what health conditions you have because for all intents and purposes, I have used one before that at a much smaller weight than I am now and outwardly, I look totally mobile, like totally fine. And you definitely get some dirty looks from people like, why is that perfectly healthy looking person getting pushed through the airport in a wheelchair, you know? So I tend not to be that kind of person. I don't normally give people a second look if they're in the wheelchair, doesn't bother me. But if you are just overweight and you just wanna use the wheelchair because you don't wanna walk to your desk or to your flight, I don't agree with that at all. In fact, I think that's wrong because like when I had to wait on a wheelchair because they're like, there are so many people who need them and there's only a certain amount of staff who handles that portion of the job at the airport. Um, so they are definitely stretched really thin. And I just don't like the idea that someone who doesn't necessarily need it because they can walk would use it and then there's someone who like can't and now they don't have a wheelchair. Permanent part of my life and I don't feel equipped to answer every single question about it. But what I will answer is if you're someone who is um, somewhat mobile, but not required to have a wheelchair, but maybe isn't able to walk to gate. Again, you're gonna call that disabilities desk and you're gonna ask for wheelchair transport. They will pick you literally up at the ticket gate and they will take you right through into your plane. Now, one thing to think about is they may not stop for food. They may not stop at a gift shop. Just depends on who your wheelchair person is. So again, they be will. nice to them. They'll stop anywhere you, you want to stop. stop. If you're nice to them and be prepared, maybe bring some snacks and stuff in case you can't stop before the gate. One thing to look out for is sometimes walking to the ticket counter can be long. So make sure you're having someone drop you off as close as you can to that ticket counter. So really your only long walk is to get into that ticket counter. Or if you have your own wheelchair, but you're not bringing it on the trip, have someone wheel you to the ticket counter and transition into their wheelchair, whatever might happen there. Now, if you're bringing your own wheelchair, again, I'm not as experienced, but I am doing research and we'll have a whole video on that in the future. But that's what you can do if you're partially mobile. I will say, do not rely on the carts. Say, oh, I don't need a wheelchair. I'm just going to take the cart. I have made that mistake and it was hell. Don't do it. Just get the wheelchair. They've dealt with all sizes of people and all sizes of wheelchair. They'll be fine. So does she take the wheelchair everywhere? Last thing we're going to talk about in this video, and again, this is all based on your questions. We keep them coming and we'll keep answering them. But everyone's asking about excursions. How do I book them? The first questions we had is about massages and spa experiences. All I'm going to say is you can like do those. Google. I have never had a massage table I couldn't get on. Let's say some of them were a little bit smaller than I would have liked, but I've always been able to have a good experience with a massage, a facial, a body scrub, <clears throat> a body wrap. Like that anything. Reminds me, I should online, email my masseuse. Be okay. I want an appointment so bad problems, for 90 robe. minutes. So I actually travel with my own robe so that I'm comfortable and that's not an issue. Then we're going to talk about theaters, concerts, and other shows. I don't need the a robe. The most important part making? to have a good experience at a theater, concert, or other show is to call ahead. There are seats for bigger bodies. There are also seats for wheelchairs. And there are also bench seats in most concert, show, and venue, uh, other venues. If you don't call, you can't get those tickets. You can't look at a seating chart. Most of those tickets are not available for general purchase. They are saved for people who need them. So you need to call in and get those tickets. Good thing is, is they're often also closer. But they're not normally reserved so for like people of size, well. as she says. You get a ticket that a, they're normally reserved for people who are handicapped. More enjoyable to watch the show in, but also B, because it might actually be a better ticket than you would have gotten anyway. So call in, get the help you need. Again, it's advocating for yourself. It's not a burden. And the last thing we're going to talk about, and again, I'm going to be doing a better video that's just for people who are in limited mobility or potentially in a wheelchair. We talked about how to pick activities. 
And it really comes down to like three things. Know what you're capable of and underestimate it. It's better for you to pick an activity that's too easy than too hard. And it's also better to pick your first activity before you pick all your others. So I always like to do a starter thing to figure out how hard was that for me? And then I can make better judgments of what I can do for the rest of the trip. I like a couple different sites to find activities and get at this information and also chat with the host to find out if they're good for, for someone in my body. I love to use Viator. It has a ton of information, allows you to chat with the host, has ratings and reviews so you can read it. Mm. And then you're also kind of secured if you're nervous in a new country, it's a safe way to take a, a, a tour or a trip. The second place I love is All Trails. It's a hiking app if you're someone that wants to be outdoors and try different trails. All Trails will tell you the difficulty of the trail, how I far use it all is, trails. and also allow you to see pictures so you can kind of really assess if it's gonna work for you. I also love um, two other websites I love, are obviously TripAdvisor, another place to get reviews and ideas to do things, but also this site called Atlas Obscura. If you're like me and you like things that are a little bit weird in the world, Atlas Obscura has all kinds of unusual things to do in different countries and places, and many of them are a car ride away, meaning you don't necessarily have to be mobile to see them. So they're very interesting, unique, different things that you can see in cities that are often very accessible. So that is everything from your questions on our first video. And we have so many more videos like this planned. I'm just excited to help all of you travel more. So with that, I'll see you guys in the next video. I'll check you later and I guess get out there and see like the, the world. I the point of what she's doing. Y'all, I'm going to break this chair and then Tom's going to freak out. I kind of like what she's doing, but at the same time, I don't know. Some A lot of this stuff is just like basic information. So I don't even know why they're asking her the question when they could just Google it. My number one answer to things is normally just Google it because Google's gonna give you an answer faster than waiting a week and a half for her to post the answer to a video. Like the thing about the CPAPs and stuff. I don't know, I still, the wheelchair thing and like transport in the airport is still a little up in the air for me on whether I agree with people of size just using them just because i feel like she talked way too long about the seat thing i don't know y'all i didn't find anything to be necessarily like crazy in this video or bad per se and i don't know enough about glitter and lasers to like have anything specific to say about her i do feel and this is just a random throw in right here at the end but I really feel that, and maybe I'm wrong. Someone, if you make it to the end of this video, tell me if I'm right or wrong. I just feel like she essentially uses her body as like a money grab almost. Like she definitely does stuff to like accentuate how big it is. And so it would not benefit her to, to lose weight because I imagine a lot of people watch her channel just because of her size. Um, I saw this comment previously and it was about Amberlynn Reed. When her in when your income is dependent upon your poor health, then your health will stay poor. I might have done that wrong, but I just thought, wow, that makes so much sense for a lot of these like plus size YouTubers because there's a lot of people who come around just because they are the size that they are and want to see them do things. And I don't know. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying, I don't know. No, I don't like it. All right. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.